All right, welcome back, World History. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off yesterday, which was the outbreak of World War One. Okay, so we saw the the uh, alliance system, along with the other parts of Mania, drag all the countries of Europe into war. Okay. Um, beginning with the short term cause, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. <clears throat> Austria Hungary delivers that ultimatum to Serbia. Serbia compromises but says, yeah, we're not going to do it all. Therefore, Austria Hungary declares war on Serbia because Germany had written it a blank check. Russia starts mobilizing its troops on the Austro Hungarian border and the German border, making them a little bit nervous. Uh, the Germans declare war on Russia. Germans declare war on France because France is allied with Russia. Germany jumps in on the side of its allies, and we have the World War. Okay, coming back here, um, just to let you guys know, I put this up here. Um, when we're talking about militarism, which is one of the uh, causes, you can get a get a, a picture here of how large the standing armies were. And then, um, just for your reference, here are the main belligerents. I already mentioned some 60 countries would participate, but these are the main belligerents. A belligerent maybe someone that's at war. Okay. Um, there's uh, the countries and their rulers. You can take a look at that. I have limited time, so I'm moving along here. Um, and it's important to note that the summer of 1914, millions of troops marched happily off to war. Uh, they had forgotten the horrors of war. It had been some 40 years since Europe's last war. They were in a la-la land. Uh, they thought it was going to be over in four to six weeks, home for Christmas as a hero. Um, and it would be a sober awakening to support my claims. <laughs> uh, claim evidence reasoning, right? Okay, so to support my claims, here are some British soldiers, again, marching happily off to war. Some German um, boys on their way. They all signed up together straight out of high school. And uh, here are some Germans marching off with a lady in, uh, at, at his side. Um, we're going to skip this. This is something I normally did in class, but it's very interesting, you guys, uh, to note. If you're interested, you can look up. There's a few videos and things on here. Kaiser Wilhelm II, Kaiser Wilhelm II, Willie, and Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, Nikki, those were their nicknames for each other. These guys are cousins. And they literally have telegraphs going back and forth. They're called the Willie Nikki letters, going back and forth of them two cousins grew up together, attending the same um, uh, weddings and funerals and births and birthdays. Uh, they were actually quite close by the name, as you can see. There's a set of telegraphs of them going back and forth trying to avoid war because they're on the opposite side of the alliances. Okay, uh, a couple political cartoons you can take a look at. Let's uh, jump into the war itself. Um, the first year of the war is the, is the awakening where we thought it was going to be over in four to six weeks. Both sides are forced to dig in, okay, and this forms what we call a stalemate, meaning both sides are stuck where they are. Nobody's winning any ground. And this was due to the industrialization of war. Okay, the Industrial Revolution not only created new consumer goods and new methods of transportation, it also um, created new weapons. All right, and the big one being the machine gun forced men, you, you could no longer stand up and shoot at each other because a machine gun could take out an entire uh, troop. Uh, or a brigade. Um, okay, why were people so eager for war? One of those reasons was propaganda. We're going to come back. I'll do a separate video on this, separate lesson. We're going to do a big thing on it next week. Okay, but propaganda had everybody convinced they were drinking the Kool-Aid. Uh, I mentioned in the previous video that we have two major fronts. Okay, we have two fronts. One being the Western and one being the Eastern. Okay. Two fronts. And uh, they had some similarities, but uh, quite a few differences. The Western Front will be known for uh, trench warfare. 
Okay, that's where most of the trenches were. There were some trenches on eastern, but it was more mountainous, mountainous, and the, the 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 fronts moved a lot more. Here it was dug in. There was some twenty five thousand miles of trenches. Okay, uh, because the trenches snaked. They weren't a straight line. They went all the way from the North Sea to Switzerland. They had uh, the primary trench, reserve trenches, trenches that connected, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I'll let you look that over. The Eastern Front, again, much more mobile of a war. They weren't bogged down in the trenches. Um, Russia invaded Germany, was, was uh, quickly defeated, and then kind of got pushed back. Eventually, Russia will lose quite a bit of this territory in the Treaty of brest uh, Austria-Hungary was not a very big power. They were defeated by the Russians, so Germany was the big dog here. Uh, let's not forget that Italy had been, Italy had been on Germany and Austria-Hungary's side. Italy decides that when the war breaks out, Italy decides to remain neutral because they said um, Germany and Austria-Hungary had had provoked the war, and then eventually Italy will jump in on the Allied power side in with Great Britain. France, and eventually the United States. Um, they jumped in uh, in the hopes of gaining some land. Okay, Bulgaria jumps in on the side of Germany and Austria-Hungary. Everybody's looking for something to gain out of it. Okay. Uh, the year 1916 to 1917, that time period, so 14 to 15 is the stalemate. 16 to 17 is the great slaughter. Um, this is the you know the Battle of the Somme and a whole bunch of these Battle of Europe um, million man casualties. Okay, let's not forget a casualty is killed or wounded. Um, we have battles that last days and weeks in which millions of men are killed. Trenches. I posted a video, a short video. I posted from YouTube on trench warfare. You can check it out. It's like three or four minutes. Look at it. Um, one on the trenches themselves, and then I posted a separate video on the weapons. Okay. How the Industrial Revolution. They're both short videos. Please check them out. I normally show a longer one, but we won't. I don't have access to it. Um, World War One quickly becomes what's called a war of attrition. Kind of like, you know, who's going to... We, Who's going to run out of men first? And how can we throw more men than the other side and overrun them? Okay. Again, industrialization changes the face of war. Here's a couple pictures of trenches and dugouts and things like that. Watch the videos. I have a model of the trenches. Uh, the area in between. So let's say this is the British side. The German side would be over here, and they would have the same, they have the same thing faced off. This area in between is called no man's land. Okay, that's where you didn't want to be. At. That's where you got shot or blown up. Um, you could be shot or blown up in your trenches also, but you at least had a sense of security and a way to get out of the shell fire. Here you didn't. A couple more things on uh, trenches. Uh, the BBC does an excellent documentary on World War One. If you guys, I know there's some of you World War One buffs out there, you could watch hours of it. BBC on YouTube. Um, poison gas is used in World War One. I'm gonna have to skip this assignment. You can also look this up. Poison gas was a horrible weapon. It is now outlawed. And just so you know, the Germans were the first to use it, but everyone uses it. In World War One. Horrible, horrible weapon. Skip over this DBQ. All right, war in the air. Uh, first, again, Industrial Revolution. First war in which we used airplanes and uh, zeppelins, or the blimp. Blimps were useful because they could fly at night. They could fly higher. They were used for reconnaissance, and they had a heavier payload. They could carry larger bombs okay uh we get the term dogfight which is when airplanes began to shoot at each other and try and take each other out 
<clears throat> the war widens again some 60 countries will participate by the end <clears throat> the colonies of various different countries we have the Gallipoli campaign which is over here uh, in here I'll let you guys read about that there's some videos on YouTube also um, and basically we see Europe looking like this okay here's the Ottoman Empire jumps in Bulgarian Ottoman Empire had jumped in on the side of Germany and Austria-Hungary and um, so you got red being central powers green being the allied powers and in comes the United States how why uh, the United States remains neutral until the year 1917 and they are drawn into the war uh, the United States tried to have its cake and, and uh, eat it eat it too we were trading and making a lot of money and we're loaning money to Great Britain and France we're making a ton of money okay but trying to remain neutral now I, I mentioned perspective at the beginning of the war at the, the first video and perspective comes in again if if your Great Britain and the United States had been trading with you and now the United States isn't trading with you, but trading with Germany, excuse me, with Great Britain and France. Well, you're going to see them as the enemy. Even though the United States had continued to trade with Germany until Great Britain had put a blockade. Long story short, the three uh, Germans begin to view us as the enemy. Here's a couple of significant dates and events that led to war. Again, we tried to remain neutral, but trade and loans in Germany's perspective got in the way. Um, also, the, the sinking of the Lusitania is very important. Some 1,200 people were killed. This was a cruise ship, a non-combatant, non-warship that the Germans sank because they thought it was carrying contraband, which is illegal weapons, and uh, that was true. The British were smuggling weapons, but 128 Americans are dead. So this is turning the sentiment of the United of Americans against the Germans. Um, the U.S. demands an, an end to unrestricted submarine warfare. The Germans do for a period of two years, but then they bring back unrestricted submarine warfare. Unrestricted submarine warfare is when the Germans basically shoot first and ask questions later. Uh, the Battle of Jutland is significant, and in January of 1917, the Germans felt the only way that they were going to win this war is to reinstate unrestricted war, submarine warfare. They bring it back, and uh, the United States says, all right, that's enough. We're in. When the United States comes in, we turn the tide of the war. It's fresh bodies. It's more bodies. It's a psychological boost, morale. The Americans come in, whooping it up, ready for action. And uh, it'll be less than a year, or about a year-ish. And, uh, sorry, a year and a few months, that uh, the Americans turn the tide of the war. All right, we'll stop there and we'll pick up tomorrow.